Hello, this is Crystal Meach with Dow of the Heart, and today I have Matt Robinson as my guest. Hi, Hello, and um, this is my first time meeting Matt, so yeah, let's just dive right in and tell me all about, so I met you on Alignable, mm -hmm. and um, you're an author. Tell me, tell me oh, more about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, basically I've been a writer and an educator for my career, you know, a little bit of more or less of, of each of them in, in turn. Uh, currently I'm teaching at, um, a local sheriff's office, which is basically a minimum security penitentiary, which is a uh, very rewarding. I'm teaching a, a writing class and an entrepreneurism class. Um, and, uh, I've been writing, I started in the music industry, working at radio stations, working for record labels, wrote for billboard for a while. Um, then my other big things have been a, a lot of travel writing. Um, I wrote, I was the editor for the Massachusetts teachers union, uh, for a number of years while I was teaching. Um, and I also do segments about food on uh, iHeartRadio. And I'm starting a column about veterans who run their own businesses. I, I never had the honor to serve, but it's really been uh, very gratifying and interesting to meet people in that community and to try to uh, you know help promote their businesses and learn just the lessons that they learned from the military that have transferred to business. It's uh, been very enlightening. I, I bring it up a lot in my entrepreneur class, uh, just about you know the, how special training that doesn't necessarily lead to a particular field, but can still be very very helpful. Um, and then as far as author, um, I've had ideas on my computer forever, but being a freelancer, I never really, you know, would take the time because I made my living writing for other people. Uh, unfortunately, about 15 years ago, my father was diagnosed with frontal temporal dementia. Uh -huh. And I started to find out how strong it was in his family. And being someone who, you know, makes a living with my words, I got nervous. And I figured it was time to, you know, I wanted to see one of the ideas through to fruition. So uh, my dad had gone to Brown University in Providence, and I had been going with him there since I was a little kid. And Ivy League football not being, you know, much to watch all the time, I kind of fell in love with the mascot. It was a, someone in the big bear costume with the big head and, you know, anonymous and uninhibited and just running amok, having a wonderful time. <laughs> and it just totally intrigued me. It was like, you know, people would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would say the brown bear. Um, <laughs> so it just kind of stuck with me. And so the idea for this book was, originally it was just sort of a history of, of mascots, but then I kind of changed the shape and it became sort of this, uh, this book about the Ivy League and how it was started and fun facts about the, about the schools. And, um, you know, unfortunately, my, my father didn't live to see it published, but it's it's been really gratifying, you know, to have opportunities like this to share it with people and and to uh, talk about the, the process that, that went into it. And a lot of people have told me that, um, you know, that after seeing this presentation that I've been doing around the country, that, you know, they had an idea that they wanted to publish and it kind of gave them the inspiration. And, you know, also for people who have or want ties to the schools you know that's been kind of the the core audience but it's um it's really been interesting the diversity of people who who come to the events and who express interest and um you know it, it was a hard process but I, I learned a lot about about publishing and being a writer and all that and um you know working on some other books now um, amongst my other projects and and having like i said opportunities like this for which i'm very grateful so thank you again yeah. And um, so I want to know, like, when you started this project of um, making this book, like, what were some of the, the um, challenges that you walked through? Like, like you mentioned publishing or whatever. So yeah, I want to know more about that. My, you know, the, the thing I talk about in my presentation is how my path was I don't know if it's unique, but at least rare in that um, I had found a, a publisher who did books about colleges. And I really thought that I had found the perfect match. And we were talking about doing the Ivy League and a lot of the smaller athletic divisions and schools that really don't get, you know, the, the press and the notoriety that some of the, 
you know, set the, the uh, championship bowl series or whatever you call them, uh, the FCS schools get. So um, uh, it was going really well. And then um, I sent them some images from the school's websites to kind of give them a rough sense of how I wanted the layout to look. And I had on the on the email in big letters, do not use these images. You know, I don't have the, the rights to them. And two days later, I got an email called first draft. And there they were. Just, I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I, I show in, in, in my presentation, like one of the pictures was the Columbia lion, you know, going doing the number one finger. And they did the only change was they put up a second finger. And and, uh, so, um, you know, so uh, it was really frustrating because I knew that I couldn't go forward with them if they were willing to be that kind of fast and loose with um, with copyright. So I had to pull back my manuscript and then I ended up finding a, uh, a, an illustrator who was absolutely amazing. His name is Jim Rolden. He's an art professor at the University of Maine, and he just totally got it right off the bat and we were able to get it together. But self-publishing has its own set of challenges, um, you know, because I mean, as a freelancer, I'm, I'm my own business. I have to produce the con, you know, sell the content, produce the content, pay, you know, follow up to get paid and all those things, promote it. And that's what I've been doing for the past five years since the book came out is, you know, reaching out to libraries and alumni groups and rotary clubs and senior facilities and just seeing who's interested in this in this presentation and hoping that that people show up. Um, you know, it's mostly rewarding and gratifying, but quite frankly, there have been, you know, events that were not so well attended. And, you know, it makes you kind of think about whether to, to try again. Um, on the other hand, the other path of traditional publishing has become a lot more complicated these days because a lot of agents and publishers instead of just writing them a cover letter and saying, here's my idea, what do you think? Um, I've come to understand that they want you to follow them on social media and have your own million followers. And they, you know, it seems that the, even the big publishers, the major publishing houses don't want to do as much as they might once have done. Like you used to hear about the big, you know, the author would get the big advance and the book tour and I'm not seeing that as much. It seems that they, you know, they'll help you, obviously. I mean, having their reputation linked with yours is of great benefit. But um, uh, the fact that they want you to wait for six months before they respond and they ask that you don't pitch to anyone else while you're waiting, it, it you know, it can really be a long drawn out process, especially if you have a, an idea that might be timely you know, obviously you don't want to be waiting six months at a time, you know, if you're writing about, you know, the election cycle or, or something that has a definite timestamp, um, figuring out a way to move the move things forward a little more quickly has been, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm yet to find it, frankly, and I've, I've talked with a lot, you know, I, I do a, an author interview show here in Boston. And I, you know, I always ask my, my, the, my fellow authors, you know, how did you get an agent? How did you get a publisher? And they all say, it took years and years and years and I wanted to give up and, you know, a lot of them end up self-publishing. So, um, you know, as, as with anything worthwhile, it's no easy path. Um, but as I tell, as I suggest in, in my presentation, it, it's like a relationship and you really have to be in it for the long haul and you have to absolutely love the idea. And, uh, you know, admittedly there were days when the only thing that kept me going was the fact that I wanted to honor my dad uh, with the book because the process was really frustrating. But, you know, in the final analysis, I'm, I'm glad that I did it. And I've met a lot of wonderful people and, you know, hopefully been able to support other people as well. Ah, that's so sweet about your dad. Do you, so ever since he's been gone, did you ever get a sign afterwards when you published? Well, I mean, I, 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 you know, at, at the risk of being a little morbid, I brought the first yeah. copy to, you know, he has the first copy. Ah, uh, that's so sweet. <laughs> you know, so, you know, that was a kind of a bittersweet day, but, you know, um, people who knew him have, you know, kind of seen the book and, and kind of figured it out and reached out to me, which has been really rewarding. And, um, you know, uh, 
some of the schools have been more supportive than others, which has been a little a little frustrating. You know, it's a very complimentary book. I sent it to all the presidents and provosts and and communications departments before I published, just to make sure they knew that I meant well. And you know, I got permission from seven of the eight schools to go forward. And um, you know, it, it's very it's really a promotional piece. So the fact that some of the schools have not been so open to supporting it has been a little rough, but you know, I'm just, I, as a freelancer, I've just really gotten kind of adept at having, you know, a rubber rear and bouncing back and, and finding if, if the door is closed, find a window. And, um, you know, I've, I've had to be nimble and creative and, you know, I mean, like, uh, I, I presented the book at us at a staple store near Boston and, you know, it was not, it wouldn't have been my, maybe my first choice, but I met people who then, you know, suggested, oh, I'm in this group or that group and way leads on to way. And, and, um, you know, you have things like how we met and just, uh, always have to just keep trying. And because, you know, the, the return is small, but that, you know, when you get even with that one or 2%, you meet wonderful people and, and you're able to really do something. So. Yeah, just about every woman that I've met, and I've only been doing this for since May, every woman wants to write a book. Yeah, oh yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I mean. (laughs) Yeah, people email me and, you know, can you help me find a publisher and how do I do this? You know, I I only speak of my own experience, but as I did both paths, I think that's that's helpful because a lot of people kind of get stuck at the fork, you know, they don't know which way to go. They're, they both have different challenges. They both have positives and negatives as with anything. I was My hand was kind of forced because I've never been late for an assignment and I set myself a deadline of what would have been my dad's 80th birthday. So by the time things fell apart with the traditional publisher, I had about eight months left to go. And so I, I really couldn't go back and look for another traditional publisher because that would have taken, you know, I, I, that would have just, there was no end to how long that was going to take. I mean, I'm, I'm working on a, a new book that I actually started before that book now, and I'm back at that process of the six months and I have it on my calendar, you know, to follow up exactly six months later and, you know, and who, who allows you to publish, to pitch to someone else at the same time, who doesn't, it's, it's a, you really have to keep track of these things. It's, it's a, it can be, get, get kind of complicated. Um, one of the other big, findings that are uh, realizations that I came to in the process was I had always thought that a good idea was a good idea, you know, and, and if someone saw value in it, it would move forward. I went to a very large publishing conference and one of the, I can't remember which publishing house she was from, but uh, there was an, uh, an editor, you know, top editor at, at this big, like, you know, random house or, or, you know, uh, St. Martin, one of, the, one of the really big publishers. And, and she said, you know, um, publishing is a lot like fashion. We basically predict the trends years in advance. And if you just happen to catch the trend, you'll be a million seller. If not, we can't make any promises. And that, that was a little discouraging to think that, you know, that if, 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 if I didn't want to write about bumblebees and unicorns, <laughs> automatically be relegated to the slush pile. And so, you know, I, I ended up having to kind of find, find my own way, which as I've said, has been, you know, challenging, but uh, I've been fortunate that pretty much every time I'm ready to pack it in, I meet someone new who gives me a, you know, a little more, a little more gas for another mile or two. And, and we just, you know, see how it goes. Yeah. Um, I like that you just self-published, like that's, that's awesome. I mean, like, and, um, there's so many people that have those ideas and they never get heard and, you know, like to see you, you know, see it through is just like amazing. Like, (laughs) and, um. With self, I mean, it's much more of a valid, a valid option these days. Like when I was young, my father's uncle wrote his memoir and it was, you know, he made like 30 copies, 
paper bound, you know, typewritten pages and just distributed them to the family. And, it, you know, it was, he wanted to tell his story. There are great lessons in it. You know, he was the, he really, you know, came here from, from Russia, Poland, you know, when he was an infant and, you know, made quite a success of himself. And there are a lot of great lessons about, you know, being moral and being ethical and how, you know, some people might, not go take that path to success, but that he was able to, you know, make a name for himself while still treating people right. And because he treated people right, it's something that, you know, that I've always tried to, to espouse. And, you know, but these days, it, it, if you want to just print copies of a book and aren't really worried about selling them, it's, it's a very valid option. There's, I mean, the hardest part was choosing which publisher to go with. There are so many of them now. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of them promise big and deliver small. And you really have to kind of, you know, do your homework, ask around. Hopefully, um, another thing that I talk about in my presentation is finding sort of a, a circle of allies, you know, other other authors who you can trust and share ideas with. Um, because unfortunately, especially as a freelance writer, I've had a number of ideas kind of co-opted. You know, you pitch a story to a magazine they tell you they're not interested and then they have one of their staff do the same story because it's they don't have to pay you and so it, it was hard to find people i was willing to trust with my manuscript because i you know if, if i don't know you and you have an editor or a publisher already if i share an idea with you you run home say hey i got this great idea and you beat me to market and then it's the challenge is on me to prove that it was my idea first and it's it's crummy and slimy and dishonest, but, you know, there are a lot of people for whom that's kind of standard procedure. You know, they just, they're out to, uh, you know, to um, take advantage of everyone else and, and leave them all behind. And, you know, I, again, I, I try not to be that way. Um, I've probably lost a lot of work because of it, but the people I work with, I know I can trust and they know they can trust me and it, it's, it's much, you know, it's much more, manageable and, and fruitful relationship in the, in the big picture. Yeah. You just reminded me of like the matrix, the matrix movie. They had a, wasn't it like a big lawsuit settled and the woman, there was a woman that actually wrote the matrix, but then they used it from a competition or something yeah. that they yeah. had. So, so yeah, it's, you know, it's really things we don't hear about. Right. <laughs> Right, yeah. you, don't hear about, you don't hear about all the authors who aren't, you know, who aren't J.K. Rowling and John Grisham and Stephen King, you know. Yeah. As, as with any entrepreneurial venture, you know, that's the hard part because we only see the successes and people think, oh, if they could. Yes, you can. But the chances are small. You, mm -hmm. you can be that one in a million. Absolutely. I and mean, I tell this to, to the inmates I teach. It's like you could be that one in a million. But I want you to have a realistic picture of what's ahead before, you know, you pick whatever you're going to do. Yeah, that's interesting. So I want to ask you about um, the latest trend of like AI, people having books written by AI. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm, you know, I'm as, as a writer and an English teacher, I'm very much against it. I think it just complicates matters. Um, I can see it as a way to get an idea for, for an article. There was a great piece, in, I think, in the Times a couple months ago about how the columnist said, you know, I use it, I, I'll put in a topic and it'll give me angles and ideas for how to approach a topic. That seems fine, but um, especially at this stage, it's pretty obvious. You know, I mean, it's, I mean, uh, I was substitute teaching this past uh, last year at a pretty well-respected public high school in the Boston area. And, you know, I didn't know the students writing. I hadn't been with them all year. So I'm sure there were some first papers that it was in there and I just really couldn't tell the difference. And the problem is, is if you challenge the student and you're wrong, you know, you have the school and the parents and everyone on you. And as a substitute, I really just, it was, I was just too, I wasn't that confident that, you know, but uh, there was one paper that uh, the day that I took over for the teacher who was going on maternity leave, a student came to her desk and said, why did I fail this paper? 
and she showed me on her computer that there's a pro an app that you can run a paper through and it'll show you how much is AI and the whole thing was bright red, 100% computer generated. <laughs> and she said, well, you didn't write, you know, said, if you can give me your computer, I'll give the computer a B plus, but you didn't write this paper. And I, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of gumption on the student's part to actually challenge the grade. But, you know, so um, at this point, uh, it's like, I mean, previously it was with, with research. A lot of my students would tell me it's on the internet. I can use it without crediting it. It's public. Like the internet is just a delivery system. You know, you, I mean, Shakespeare still wrote Shakespeare. You can't just, if you give them credit, fine. But, you know, a, just there seems to be a misunderstanding about that these are tools and that I always say you need to be the last set of eyes on a paper and it needs to be your paper. You know, you're going to have, I mean, going back to the book, I had editors and publishers saying, you know, do this, change that. You have to decide what is really the core of your story. What are your non-negotiables? Uh, are you willing to change the gender or race or background of one of your characters to fit a demographic? Are you willing to, you know, change your thesis if it's a research paper? So, you know, it, I at this point, I think it's just complicating things. I do know a lot of teachers who completely embrace it. Um, and and say you know this is the future we're going to have to figure it out i'm still trying to you know tilt against the windmill for the time being i i, I still like to be a champion i mean of a of you know basically paper and pencil and you know i i want to know what the students know not what their computers know that's that's you know why i give the assignments i give i really i can't help my students become more confident in how they communicate if if it's not if they're not sharing their authentic ideas yeah and it's so interesting because um like even for this podcast i have riverside podcasting and uh it has ai and it um it's amazing what it cuts out yeah. like if if there's a controversial topic that i'm talking to someone about it will cut it out of the summary and <laughs> and so I have to like go back to get those pieces, you know, like and <laughs> cause like um I was in I think it was Kahan Tazadak's podcast and he was talking about, you know, the law and how um we consent to contracts that uh we don't know all the terms. And that cut out like half of the <laughs> The summary didn't even talk about that. And that was like the main point of the podcast. So I, I, um, I just think it's really interesting how people don't even understand the bias in AI. Yeah. Or, or in anything that's, you know, that's and the other, the other <laughs> issue that I really bang up against as a writing teacher is, um, is just how how students just take like I said, you know, the internet is fact. You know, I mean, I, like I'll say to them, if you're writing a paper on gun control, hopefully this won't get cut because we're talking about a controversial <laughs> topic. I say, you know, you can use the NRA as a source, but not your only source. You know, obviously that's part of the argument, but you know, you can't just have one side of the argument represented if you're if that's not. I mean, that's not complete research. And, you know, a lot of my students are just like, well, I'm writing about gun control. What, you know, what else, who else would I quote? You know, where else am I going to look? Yeah. So, you know, it just, uh, they, they, yeah, just not realizing the bias, not realizing that, you know, if it's a, a dot com, it's probably trying to sell something, you know, and it, there's just kind of the, I always work in a class on media literacy because I just, it's, I just think that it, the, 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 the examples I'm getting hint strongly that the, the students are just going on Google, looking up their topic, picking the first three pages without really any, you know, investigation and just copy and pasting and and assemble, assembling other people's ideas is not the same as considering other people's ideas. Yeah. And I guess it just goes to like the education system, like how it's been so watered down and um, yeah. 
Yeah, how do we bring it back? I guess. <laughs> when I was writing for the union, I mean, some of the things I had to to write about. Quite frankly, I wasn't, you know, such a fan of the policies, but it's it's you know it, it's it's complicated. I mean, in Boston, we have one of touted as the best public high school in the country, Boston Latin, the oldest school, oldest public school in the country, and then we also have schools where, you know, where I taught in you know closer to downtown that it's they're miles away and yet worlds away i mean just they they and they were changing their policies just trying things on all the time and it got the kid the students were confused and felt abandoned and left behind and and just yeah it, it really didn't didn't do much good and then you know we've had covid and and the difference in the losses but so yeah i mean Students in the suburbs of Boston, their parents are doctors and lawyers and teachers, and they get private tutoring and all, you know, and they have all the latest technology. And if you live, if you live in a single parent or no parent home in the middle of, you know, downtown Boston, you're not, you're not getting that. And, you know, if, if you feel that your teachers aren't reaching out to you, you're not going to reach back. And that's, you know, it's unfortunately, it's a really complicated cycle to break and everyone thinks they have an idea, but I haven't really, you know, seen, seen, seen one yet. Yeah. And, um, I'm just thinking as a single parent myself, I mean, I, I grew up in Wisconsin. <laughs> I feel like I'm insulated <laughs> because but at the same time, yeah, there's right around the corner, there's understanding, like, I look at the history books here, and it's, <laughs> and I had public um, education, too. But, yeah, there's a lot that's, um, you know, even, even what's being taught today is <laughs> maybe not the same as what I saw. And then, then you dig a little deeper and you realize maybe what you were taught wasn't necessarily right either. So it's very interesting. <laughs> you know, the story of the pilgrims is a very interesting story. You know, was it a happy, let's all get along and share? Or was it, this is the beginning of a changing of the guard on this landmass and, you know, and uh you know there's apparently a debate to take the image of the native american off our state flag and you know is it is it remembering our history is it is it taking advantage is it you know it's 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 a it's a very you know complicated this country has a very complicated history we're, we're talking about you know about immigrants it's a big issue if not for them what would this part of the world be yeah and having known that how do we call at the end um yeah i'm just thinking of like and once you know that like how do you create your world from that education right yeah and yeah i mean you know, just are are there things that can be made right you know i mean does you know retribution and and supporting various causes and changing the history books you know what what is it all really going to do and, and will enough people buy in that it becomes a significant movement or is it just sort of you know i mean being in this part of the country it's it's a, it's an echo chamber of certain views and beliefs when i travel it's very different just you know i mean i have family in in louisiana and just the way that they structure their day and the way what their priorities are it's it's very different sometimes a little disorienting that we are in the quote unquote united states of america and it's like you know 50 countries not 50 states so you know it, or even if i just go up to new hampshire it's it's very different up there and that's not so far away so uh yeah but um it, it, you know what what we think is the truth here is not is not a not necessarily a shared value I, you know, the hard part is a lot of people 
don't get out of town. I, I mean, I grew up in Massachusetts, but I've been privileged enough to travel a lot because of my writing. So I have seen other perspectives in other parts of the world. A lot of people I know don't. I mean, especially when I was teaching in Boston, those kids, I had one student, he didn't think Fenway Park, home of my beloved Red Sox, he didn't think it was real. <laughs> he went to Fenway Park and he looked up at it. He goes, what's that? I'm like, oh, that's Fenway Park. He goes, you mean it's real? I was like, what? <laughs> I thought it was just a TV show. <laughs> How did he respond? He lived three miles away and had never seen it. It's wow. Funny. Well, I mean, it's funny because you can't cry anymore. I mean, it's just, I, I just had never, I was so you know, gobsmacked by that this is possible. You know, I mean, yeah. even if you have it, even if you can't afford to be inside, which is a high, much different than when I was growing up. You know, you should know that it exists and maybe you've gone to, you know, visit it or a place near, you know, it's near, I mean, it's right downtown. It's kind of hard to miss if you're in Boston. But <laughs> that, was, that was the response. And I I just didn't really know what how to respond to that. <laughs> Especially when it's three miles. I mean, that's kind of like walking distance. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I've walked the Fenway much further further away because parking is impossible. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Um, it's, um, I'm just thinking of like so many things that we don't know, do know, and how um, relative our life is. Like, that all that exists outside of us versus what, how we live our lives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> we'll get back to you. <laughs> and <laughs> um, I want to know more about, like, you have other books potentially that you want to write. Oh, yeah. Do you want to, I mean, I, I you want have, to talk about I that? Have a whiteboard on my wall just of ideas. And there's all, I mean, as I tell my writing students, I say, you know, every idea is a possible story. It's just finding finding an audience. You know, I mean, I know a lot of people, you know, like we were talking about before, who have a story they want to publish and it'll be on like mine was. It's on their computer. Oh, it's not good enough. No one else is going to care. If you just want to do it for yourself, just to say you did it. I mean, you know, holding that first copy in my hand, like I said, it was a bittersweet moment because my dad wasn't there to, to see it. But, you know, it was an accomplishment. It was something I wanted to do. And, you know, maybe I haven't sold as many copies as I thought, but the people I've met and the connections I've made, you know, it's been really wonderful. And to turn that into a TV show where I interview other authors, and now I'm taking that TV show as like a speaker's tour around New England to, you know, senior centers and libraries and things. It just, it's just expanded and expanded and expanded. And it's, it's really just been a, a whole new circle of circle of, of friends and contacts that I wouldn't have otherwise had. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely, you know, I, I encourage if you, if you have an idea, go for it. I mean, it is complicated. It is, it is, it can be very frustrating. You know, my concern, frankly, is basically, I met a, an agent who uh, just seemed kind of open to talking, even though she didn't necessarily specialize in the types of books that I was dealing with. So I sent her like, these are the eight ideas that I've been percolating on right now. And she's like, I think these are the three you should focus on for the time being. And I just took her word for it because, you know, it's hard enough to do one at a time, let alone eight. So, you know, I've really been focusing on this one book which is about um, uh, music and world culture. It's kind of uses um, the percussion family to talk about the cultures that that created these different instruments and how they've all influenced traditional Western music. Um, and I'm hoping to turn it into a curriculum and a whole study guide. It, you know, it's a huge project, but it's been really rewarding. I've, I've met some amazing musicians and that takes me back to my start of my career as a music writer and things of like getting back into that world. Um, but you know, who, maybe I picked the wrong horse. I don't, it's, it's so hard, you know, it's all so subjective. 
and hopefully I'll have time to get back to some of those other five, six ideas, or maybe I'll have a new idea. Uh, it just, you know, the hard part is just finding the time to do it all. Um, you know, and as a freelancer, I'm still looking for more work for other people to, you know, to pay my bills. So it's, it's a real balancing act. Every day is a lot of big decisions. Am I going to work on my book? Am I going to pitch a story to a magazine? Am I going to do this project for my client? And, and, uh, you know, it, it gets complicated, but, um, I, you know, I really, even though the first book, like I said, wasn't the dream of a New York times bestseller. I mean, that I really wasn't expecting that, but you know, it was, it's been, it was frustrating. It was, it was a lot more involved than I thought, but I'm going to give a try with this second and maybe third book and, you know, see, see, see where it goes. I mean, it's, it's just basically at this point, I've, I've worked on it too far to too long to let it go. I just want to see, you know, see it through. I've kind of crossed the Rubicon on it. So, um, and you know, I'm, I'm meeting great people who believe in it. So hopefully I can find more of them and, and keep going. So, so yeah, what I'm hearing is you just got to keep persevering. Like, um, and that's so true in like any career. I mean, <laughs> and um, what's interesting is like, you get these ideas and you start and you just don't know where it's going to go. Like, yeah. and I mean, it, it's still, even with AI and all that, there's still this subjective element. I mean, if the publisher I'm pitching that day has a cold or had a fight with their children that morning, they may just not be up for a new idea, you know, or they may just not get it. But, you, you know, you keep trying. Hopefully you find that match. Yeah. And I think um, one thing that AI doesn't have is the connection. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Till you're talking to a robot and you, re you realize you're talking to a robot, right? <laughs> it's sometimes I kind of wish there were, you know, a algorithm of you know, if you write, I mean, like they said at that, sh that, that event many years ago, if you write a book about bumblebees and unicorns, you'll be a million seller. But because I don't, you know, we don't necessarily know what the predicted trend is yet. We can't be leaning into it. It's just, it's still, there's a lot of luck and, you know, and being able to read the tea leaves a little better than other people or just being faster to market. Do you think that people notice though, um, if you're writing for a trend versus authentically as you? I mean, you know, I, I, be, having been in education, being a parent, I mean, I see some of the things that students and, and children read or that's popular. You know, I don't want to cast aspersions. I don't want to sound like sour grapes, but there's a lot of stuff out there that's popular that, you know, I wouldn't like my kids to read. It seems inappropriate, a little vulgar. You know, it talk. I mean, it talks about things that I don't, you know, I mean, that young people should be exposed to at that age, et cetera. I mean, same with TV, same with anything, um, you know, but it, it's, it's, I mean, it's sort of like, uh, you know, going to a, a four star restaurant versus going for fast food. You know, what, what do you need at that moment? If you just need something to, to read that you can feel confident as a reader because it's not that challenging then great then this is then you know this is why certain things are popular and other things you know other popular things are still great literature i mean you know i'm um so um there's there, I, there's 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 an audience for everyone it's it's just it's finding it it's finding the audience you know like being you know with with the internet anyone can be published but will I, will will you be read? That's really the question. You know, can you can you find an authentic an audience? So you know, writing to a trend, if it helps get your name out, if it helps you, you know, have that little safety net of this is you know this should sell because you know it's in line with this other. I mean, how many books have we seen about teenage magicians since <laughs> a certain series came out? You know, I mean, that's it, right? Not everyone mm -hmm. is up to that quality. Those books are masterworks. 
I mean, the, 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 that the whole through story was conceived ahead of time. It's like Star Wars. The whole idea was there before it was begun. But there are a lot of others who've tried and, you know, they have some success, but, you know, they're not going to be held up as the exemplar for generations to come of, of you know, the rags to riches story that that Rowling was or is. So, I mean, the, but again, these are, these are the stories we hear about. You know, you don't hear about the people who didn't create the wheel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's all the hero's journey. <laughs> um, and it's so interesting, too, because, like, there's women that and men that are, like, retranslating some of those stories. And... Um, it's not even the same story when they retranslate it, which is fascinating to me. Like, um, for example, the hero's journey, like the destination is woman in the poetic Edda. So what is woman? Right. She's already, she's already um, done and accomplished and the man isn't. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, well, I guess uh, there's there's an interpretation, if you want, you know, of of, uh, of Old Testament that Adam is incomplete. Yeah, that, you know, Adam has a has a missing piece, and yeah. a lot of women would say that men still do. May not be good, <laughs> may be plain, but you know, anyway. Yeah, I'm fully aware. It's I'm fascinating, fully aware. you know. <laughs> Again, is that, is that subjectivity? You know, what what is the truth? Yeah, the subjectivity, and then on the other extreme, it's the literalism. Like when people take it completely literal, and they can't really um, grasp the full truth. <laughs> if, if, if there is one, that's the thing. <laughs> if there is one, yeah. <laughs> what is the truth? <laughs> Oh, fascinating. Um, let's see. What else do I want to ask? Um, you're unlike anyone that I've interviewed thus far. So I've heard that before. <laughs> do you take that as a compliment or not? <laughs> being, being the freelancer, being, you know, the, I mean, I was working from home before it was hip, you know, it, it, it has its challenges, you know, it is a little isolating sometimes, but, you know, um, because I've just been able to turn this skill of writing into so many things, you know, it, it's, I mean, the hardest part is choosing which road to run down every morning, you know, am I gonna, you know, try to get another, I mean, I, I miss writing about music. Um, there aren't as many places to do it these days. So, you know, if I meet a really interesting musician, am I going to take the time to try to craft that into a story and, and find a place to put it? Or if I kind of realize that this is an interesting person for me to know, but there's really not much I can do with it right now. But way leads on to way. I mean, I've had stories I wrote 10, 20 years ago that I now use as research for things now. So, you know, I just um, meet people diversely and, you know, have opportunities like this to, um, you know, uh, engage new audiences and, you know, if, I mean, it's the same thing when I was in the music industry, you know, if there's only one person at your concert, but that person is Ahmed Erdogan and he signs you to Arista Records, that's not bad, you know, so you just have to really just do your best with every relationship because you never know, you know, where it's going to go. Yeah. Um, the same thing, with, the same thing with the book, you know, if, if, uh, you know, if, if um, I have one person, but they're head of the Harvard Alumni Club of, you know, Alaska, and then all of a sudden I'm doing a Zoom call to 100 people in Alaska, you know, then it would then meeting that one person was totally, totally worth it. May not seem so at the time, but you just, you know, do your best and smile and, and, um, 
And just like that's really been some of the best experiences is just those one or two people who, you know, the event, the event where you met them was disappointing in terms of pure numbers, but the opportunity was, you know, was amazing. And that's kind of how I've made my career is just being fortunate enough to find those people just at the right time and get another bump. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And it's, um, it's interesting how um, people like connect. Like, yeah. I mean, I've always for 18 years, I was an accountant. So I was just kind of like back office and I had my team and, you know, I didn't talk to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so these five months, like I've met so many different people. And um, it's amazing how your world expands, like, it's new ideas, new people, new ways of thinking, and new ways of doing things. And um, there's not a direct path for everyone. Like, right. you know, it's going to be a zigzag. It's <laughs> but, and all but, the choices. If you can, if you can hang on, it's a fun. It can be a really fun. It can be dizzying and nauseating but it can also be a lot of fun. <laughs> well exactly <laughs> and it's a full spectrum of feelings and oh, yeah. can you really um yeah can you really hang on can you really um authentically be you at the end of the day um as an author and um that's like, I commend your journey, like what you've said, because there's so many women that, you know, they go back to work every day. And they, I mean, there's the, there's like no hope, I guess I'll say, in that world. Whereas you are creating every day and making that choice every day. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, again, it's not always easy, you know, people who are on the traditional, you know, gold watch career path still don't get it, but it's much more acceptable. And, you know, I, I actually used to write a column for the Boston Herald about people who change careers late in life. And, you know, it's, I mean, you're, you know, you're case in point, you know, you're, you're, if you can pay your bills and find something enriching, you know, I mean, teaching at a, at a prison is, you know, not a obvious choice, but I I love it. Yeah. It's absolutely gratifying, and I feel I'm making a difference, and that's why I teach. So, you know, being able to share, honor my dad, and share these stories, and meet amazing people, you know, it's sort it's been the reward on the back end is really kind of made up for all the headache on the front end. And so, you know, I'll just I guess I'll keep doing it. <laughs> And it's so interesting, uh, we didn't even touch on the the prison, but there's got to be some pretty talented people there. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a share, you know, it's a minimum security. They, they made a mistake, and they're trying to get things back together again. And so my hopefully my classes help them. Um, you know, uh, yeah, we can, that's, that's a whole conversation. We, we can talk about education uh, for, for, you know, Forever and ever. So I've I've I've, taught, I've been teaching for a long time at some very different, um, you know, facilities and situations. And, yeah. Fascinating. Well, I think that's a good place for us to stop. Right. And um, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. And I would love to have you on again. I'm I'm I'm, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> We'll stay in touch. Um, I will put all of your information in the description box below and your books so that anyone that's interested can click and uh, check you out. And thank yes. you so much. You help or you have a book idea that you want, you know, a little uh, encouragement and anything I can do to, to support other creative ventures. That's, that, that's what I'm about. So it's great. Oh yeah. I have a whole, um, a whole giant plastic bin full of probably like 50 journals that I've written. 
<laughs> so yeah. you definitely have my um, mind churning. It's it's a matter of finding the time. <laughs> yeah, you know, unfortunately, I had you know a reason to take the time. I had kind of a, a little push, which you know is the the the, the sad part of the story, as it you know. But um, but it, it was it was worth it was definitely worth doing. It's definitely worth doing. Awesome. Thank you so much. Bye. Here. Stop.